get started with the uh, for the morning. So we're very happy to have uh, Christian Capetti, who is going to tell us about higher structure of chiral symmetry. So please go ahead. Okay, good. You you hear me fine? Yeah, seems so. Good. So I'm gonna give uh, a talk about this recentish paper with Michele, who was there, Cantalo Modi, and Yifan Wang. And uh, okay, I chose to give a blackboard talk, so it's half an hour. So we'll try to make some comments of what we wanted to do in this paper, give some examples. And if you want to learn more, you should read the paper uh, because yeah, there's no way. To... So, okay. So this kind of introduction slide, so I, I already wrote it down. So what kind of questions did we want to address in this paper? So we work here in four dimensions. So this is like the only example we give. So this four dimensional QED. And uh, so, one thing we want to kind of understand is what is the natural equivalence relation that you have to put on symmetry defects in higher dimensions, because it seems that in many constructions you get uh, infinity, infinite families of defects, and physically it's maybe not so natural because some of these data are not detectable from the bulk. So in this example, we try to give uh, a bit the idea of what you should do. Then another thing is to try to, comp given the defect, so in physics, usually you have a definition of the defect in some way, and then you have to compute the, the data of, uh, of its category. It's not given to you. So we try to give some way to compute it in this case, at least to some extent, kind of explicitly. And the third question was, uh, if you have this kind of non-invertible symmetry in higher dimension, what is like an economical way to derive world identities? Because uh, in, in 2D, it's kind of known what you do. But in other dimension, you have many manifolds. Uh, and if you try to approach the problem with brute force, it becomes very complicated. OK. So uh, again, the example will be for the QED. So what the old law, I mean, we have seen this already many times in this workshop, is that the chiral symmetry in QED is broken by the ABJ anomaly at the quantum level. But the new law is that this is not really true but is actually replaced by non-invertible symmetry, which is Q mod Z. And uh, let me introduce the symmetry defects, and then I will tell you what we will do with them. So you can consider quite a large family of symmetry defects, which implement this symmetry, this TPN. I put a subscript Y here. So these are made up, made up of the naive zero form uh, symmetry defect of the chiral symmetry. So here I'm normalizing things so, so, so that uh, u of zero is equal to u of one in my notation, okay? Times a TQFTY, uh, it's, it's two labels, So what the, which couples to the field strength. So this TQFTY must have two, two qualities. First, it, it must have a one form symmetry Zn, so it actually couples only to the, the flux of f over two pi mod n. And uh, this is the first. And the second thing, this symmetry must have a prescribed Toft anomaly, which is, uh, I give you the inflow action, uh, which is just the Pontryagin square. And this is a Zn gauge field. So you can think of this kind of a Zn gauge field. Okay. So, but there are many theories which have these two, these two characteristics. This is the second one. Is it good enough here? I have to put it up above. It seems fine, no? Okay. So um, before, let me tell you something more about this structure. So of course, since you have this zero form symmetry defect in the beginning of the formula, the category of this chiral symmetry is graded, graded by Q mod Z. I'm just saying that, of course, uh, when you know that label, uh, so this is like direct sum. Over... Let me write this as <laughs> roughly as some family, which are labeled by Y. OK. And let me also give a kind of a warning for the studies. So here we work on spin manifolds. And this is also the case where well, this symmetry is actually Q mod Z. And, uh, but it's not really the, the natural setting for QED because in QED, the minus one to the F is a subgroup of the gauge group. So really it's a bosonic theory. You can put it on non-spin manifolds. So a more precise analysis would be also to include the non, 
do not treat this T of T as spin theories, but as bosonic theories. And the, the analysis become more complicated for some uh, technical reasons. And I think more, Morally speaking, the symmetry should be kind of a double cover <laughs> of the on non-spin manifolds because there are some TQFTs which become non-trivial on non-spin manifold, but they are trivial spin TQFTs. And this is just kind of a technical comment, but we will always work on spin manifolds, okay? Good. So let's go back to the definition here of the why, no? So first we can use a kind of recentish result. Uh, which says the following, a bit slightly translated, maybe. So given a TQFT, which couples to a one-form symmetry, this is the N gauge field, okay? It's always possible to rewrite this theory as a minimal theory, which is called a, we call AMP. This couples to the ZN. I will tell you what this is now, times some new theory, Y tilde, and this is the coupled from the one from symmetry, okay? And more explicitly, you can think of this as, uh, as this quotient. So when you stack the two, you have a, you, you have the anomaly free diagonal symmetry, you can gauge it, and this is what this is. There is always this factorization. And from the point of view of the bulk, uh, this Y tilde is undetectable. in the sense that the way the bulk sees the TQFT is by having one from symmetry defects ending on this uh, TQFT here. But since this is the couple from that, it cannot be detected by a bulk correlator. So one thing which in my opinion is natural to do, but okay, I'm open <laughs> to, <laughs> to discussion on this, uh, is that you take a sort of equivalence relation in which uh, to to defects in here are equivalent. So if they differ by a Y tilde. So said otherwise of this infinite class, you can take one representative, which is the minimal one, which is this, or it dp over n. And uh, if you choose another representative here, it's not detectable from bulk correlators. So this simplifies a lot your life because you can work with these small representatives. Okay, and this we can think of some kind of equivalence relation of some kind of gauge choice. Um, okay, and let me also tell you a bit what is the AMP. So as a spin theory, this is generated by a one line L it has charge uh, P under the one-form symmetry. And uh, it has a spin. We need these formulas in example, so I, I give it uh, back. So as a spin theory, L to the N is one. But if I non spin manifold, you can have a double cover. So, OK, good. So this is just the introduction of first thing that I want to do. And uh, so now let's see if this kind of choice is compatible with the fusion rules of the category. No? So we have kind of made a choice here, which was arbitrary. Now we want this to work. So let's see if it works and if it teaches something or solves some problem. OK. This thing. So let's study the most naive thing, which is uh, the fusion of two color symmetry defects. Okay, so we want to study, uh, say, d p over n times d p over n. Okay. Now, um, yeah, I, I'm gonna take the ends to be the same here. You can take them different; it's just more technical, but it's the same conclusion. So, we'll not do it in the talk, and. Uh, what do you expect to find here? Well, the category is graded by the chiral symmetry. So the only thing you can get here is a P plus Q over N. And you can get some uh, decoupled TQFT coefficient. Uh, this is the expectation, no? Just based on the grading and on the, yeah, the grading already tells you this. 
but is this thing consistent? So let's try to see why. Let's let's make an example. So let's take uh, d one fourth. That's d one fourth. So we expect this to be. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, so in this, uh, so when you compute this product, mm -hmm. you care about these TQT coefficients because are your generalization yeah. of the fusion algebra coefficients. Yeah, you care in some sense. But, yes. uh, but previously you said that you don't want to care them because you say, okay, let me identify everything that uh, is just the stacking with the, the couple TQFT. So I, I think you should think of this in this way. You choose the representatives, right? Then what happens then when you fuse two, it's kind of a gauge choice, choosing a representative. When you fuse two guys, you get out of the gauge choice. And then this coefficient becomes sensible, maybe. But I'm not really sure. It depending on the representatives, no? Because uh, if you have extra decoupled QFT stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's not. Uh, yeah, indeed. So I don't know if this coefficient is really a physical thing. Uh, but if you choose representatives here, you can uh, have a kind of well-defined coefficient with this choice. And you. And I will show you that you can remain in this choice if you define the morphism correctly. But okay, if you ask me, is this uh, coefficient something which has physical value? I, I'm not really sure. So you can compute it, but I, I I'm a bit skeptical, uh, personally. But I don't know. I don't know uh, what is the real answer. Okay. You mean this? Yes, yes. But I, what I want to do is to choose that. I mean, if I want to do like a choice which is consistent, so I choose it at some point, then I have to define the whole thing in such a way that you can remain inside. No, right. Um, but there is a bigger problem, which is uh, if you just consider stacking of the TQFTs, uh, you find an inconsistency. So let's do this example. So you have your two defects. On each of these, you have this a, a for one theory. Okay, this is the definition essentially. So on the left hand side, I can take a one fourth symmetry surface from the bulk, and let's call it V one quarter, okay, which is just e to the two pi i over four well, integral of f over two pi. Okay, this is just what this is, and I can make it end here, for example, on the first defect. No. This is a consistent. This can end consistently and gives me the the generator of the of the symmetry category here. It's not non-zero, no. But on this side, you see this guy only couples to the Z two, so it the the surface the surface V one two can end, and also on this side that's fine. But V one quarter cannot end here because this this not couple to this uh, gauge field. So you, it seems that if I do the operation here, I get uh, some physical correlator. If I do it here, I get zero. So uh, stacking is not really consistent with this fusion rule. So I have to specify what is the correct uh, one morphism of these guys. So let's do it. Yes. You can have condensate. You, you mean that I, I can write a condensate for Z for Z2 here? Um, I mean, if I think if you take the, I mean, the, the category is graded by this uh, Q mod Z, no? So if you work in the right uh, equivalence class, it becomes invertible. Depends what you mean. Um, but so. I cannot show it on the blackboard because it's a bit longer, but if you try to fix this by stacking condensate, it doesn't work. You, you cannot. Re you can try to rewrite the lines here in this way plus a condensate, you cannot. But uh, the solution is simpler, so I will just give you what I think is the solution. Okay, so what you do in practice, uh, you can consider the set of lines generated by Uh, no, this is minus one. I, just saying one and two refer to these two guys. Okay, this is just the generator. So these guys are uh, decoupled from the bulk. We 
because this this is at the end of v one fourth. This is the end of v minus one fourth. So this you cannot detect, and the f spin, uh, which is okay. This so now you notice the following thing that uh, a k squared is decoupled and it has uh, spin equal to one. Okay, so it's possible to condense this anion. I can condense it here when I put the two things together, and I consider I can consider a junction which looks a bit like this if I can draw it correctly. Uh, um, And here I, I condense uh, one plus a squared. Okay. So what happens after I condense this? But this is kind of a standard exercise. No, you just have to look at the lines which do not braid with k squared and take uh, mod modular fusion with k squared. So here, after gauging, I get two sets of lines, which uh, are generated by L1 times L2 and k. So, oh, a lift, yes. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and um, okay, good. So this one has a uh, spin, uh, I think it's pi i over two, yes. And this also, and this has charge two. So it's, this is a, lives at the end of, uh, This la this Z2 line. So you can see that this guy here generates uh, a, a, a symmetry defect, and this generates the the coupled A to one theory. Okay, so this is what happens after condensation. So what you get on this side is uh, A to one times D one half, which couples just to a Z2 gauge field. So physically, what well, now this is consistent, no? O on the left hand side you couple to z4, and the right you couple to z2, and you get the right defect, no? And physically, what ha what's happening is that uh, after you condense, uh, if you take a line here which is uh, say L, the one which has the minimal charge, and you try to move it through, it cannot move through because it's not uh, it, it, it's it is, is killed by the condensation, it gets stuck on this wall. And now you don't have any more the problem because on one side of the fusion, you can do this. You try to move it through and it gets stuck. So there is no contradiction. While things which, are, which have charge uh, under Z2 can move through. So it's consistent. And this is the general notion. So the, the, in general, what you have to do, uh, in general, you have to gauge uh, Z, E plus Q, sorry, GCD, E plus Q, and conform symmetry when you stack two defects. And this gives you how you fuse all these guys. And it's consistent, uh, yes. Hmm? The one of, okay, what's wrong with the statement? No, this statement is correct. Is one TQFT, you can split it in this way. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, it has. Um, yes. But I, th I think what you got is that that. No, but I think engine is right. Like the statement would be here that uh, you have Z four with anomaly two over four. But that's not a full anomaly. It's like Z two part. So maybe the theory then doesn't apply. It applies when you try to gauge. So if you try to do this, 
by stacking, the problem is that you don't find a, a Z2 line, uh, this Z2 line, uh, this L1 times L2 before gauging is a Z4 line, no? Only after gauging becomes like a sensible thing. So. Yeah, yeah, you. Okay, yeah, but I had to add that the anomaly was uh, P and N were co-prime. That, that that was the correct statement. If the it's not fully anomalous, the symmetry, then the statement is not correct. Because you can, and then you can make more choices here, no? I think that's, but okay, maybe we can discuss later. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should have said it better. So how much time I have, like seven minutes? Five, okay, good. So, okay, then I will uh, make some drawings uh, and uh, talk about the world identities because maybe it's a more f fun topic. And yeah, so one thing you can do after this is you can compute associators of this category because uh, Morphism are gauging one form symmetry, and the uh, various kinds of higher morphism are, are like taking various module categories. So you can try to compute them. It's not very illuminating, but you can do it. And those things can be detected physically, but yeah, I don't have time to go through this. So let, let me give you a, also a taste for the world identities, how you want, you can uh, derive them. So the simplest case is S2 times S2, okay? So the final strategy is the following. You think of the manifold X as constructed by a boldism. Start from the point, this is the example here, you get S3. Uh, now I, I will... Uh, and here attach handles. Uh, this is a two handle, this is a two handle attachment. Is similar of what you want to do if you construct a torus uh, starting from a point. So the point S1, you attach uh, one handle, which is uh, like a strip. This becomes two S1s. And then you attach uh, one handle the other way. Comes S1. This is the same thing in 2D. This is, you just have to be a bit imaginative. And then what, what you can do to derive a world identity is that you can nucleate the defect here. Ah, yes. Okay, like this. So you, ca you can nucleate a defect in the beginning. Here you can have other decorations. You can put top other topological and topological defects around. And then you move through the boldism like this. And here you annihilate. And every time you encounter a soldier, you apply a morphism. So this tells you what maps you have to apply. You go through, and then you get the world identity. It's the same thing as what you usually do in normal cases. But here, the information about the moves you have to do is encoded in the in the boldism. Uh, and uh, as an example, so if I take uh, a result, if I take uh, a simply connected manifold, x, what you can show is that uh, uh, let me just write the formula, and then uh, I will tell you what it means. Uh, done. It's B. Small B. Uh, okay, so this, this omega, well, this uh, soldier is for simply connected manifold, at least... Uh, simpler, they have a representation as a, a framed knot. So you can write, for example, in this case, it's just the usual, like this, and the framing is a trivial one, okay? So you can think of the framed knot as uh, some uh, correlation function in the minimal theory. And then you can decorate the various uh, uh, lines with the defects of the theory and sum over them. Okay, this is what I mean by coloring. And uh, you compute this, uh, and this is actually 
you, you can do it explicitly using the, the um, intersection pairing uh, on the full manifold. So you can write this in terms of the intersection pairing. And this becomes uh, the statement of self-duality uh, under gauging. But there is some torsion. The e minus one, okay. Okay, so I think I'm, okay, one, perfect, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. So I, I wanted to do all the picture, but it's, uh, I don't have time. So let, let me maybe give a synthesis. So what we have tried to do was trying to understand physically how you should think of this symmetry in higher dimension, and how you can compute some of their categorical data. And then we have given this recipe to construct world identities in terms of all this. So this is like the simplest application. It's like uh, you derive, yes. It, it's, it's the fact that the partition function is self-dual under gauging the ZN1 from symmetry with some torsion. So you have to take this now. Uh, and uh, there, is a, there is a relation between the knot and the intersection pairing of a, 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 a on the full manifold. Okay, so you can rewrite this uh, as a pont integral of Pontiagin square in the end. Yes, so you have to go through it a bit. Uh, you can derive a selection rule if you decorate the manifold with defects. Okay, then you can derive. But the, the nice thing about this is that uh, since you're dealing with a dimensional manifold, the Boldis presentation tells you clearly what kind of operations you have to do while, while you move through, right? So then you can derive this. If you try to do this by hand, it's very hard, but here you see how you can generalize it. And then, okay, the hope is that this you can use, I mean, we didn't de develop this fully, but if you develop this uh, at all the levels, attaching various type of handles, because this we just did two handles, you can rederive the world identities for the non-invertible symmetry, which is something that uh, I don't know to do in general. I think it's interesting. Uh, because then we can understand what are some of the consequences, no? But it's not non trivial because for many faults are very complicated topologically, no? So, but some things, some things you can do. Um, so this is just maybe a, I don't know, preliminary study in some sense. Of course, it would be it would be nice to see like how anomalies, uh, this kind of things, uh, is seen in this formulation, no? I think that's that, that's what we are kind of looking at right now. Right. I'm I'm over time, no? So I just conclude. Uh, thanks, uh, and uh... questions. A quick question. I understand the self duality under gauging of, of what of uh, QED. So I mean, in QED you have you one uh, magnetic one from symmetry. You no, know? you take a ZN subgroup. You put discrete torsion for that. And then you gauge it. So the you know this uh, notation of sigma and tau. No, this is a uh, stuck in the SPT. This is gauging. Uh, the operation I think is uh, uh, sigma tau to the p sigma, maybe something like this. I think this is the operation. Uh, okay. Where p is what? P is the p of the dp over n. So if you take the for every one of these, you have a different world identity. There are a lot, but the fi fix P and N, this is gauging ZN. And you see, this is a older, uh, maybe sigma minus one, I don't remember, this is some charge conjugation difference. This is an older N operation because of an RT defect. And of course, I mean, the only thing you can write is you conjugate uh, tau, which is older N with, with the other guy. No, this is, you can check is the right thing. So you, you can put also background fields here and then it works fine, but it's more convoluted. No questions? I'm gonna wait for the mic. I think so. The, the problem is that when you want to consider more general manifolds, you have to attach uh, 
other handles, one handles, three handles, and those correspond to higher morphism of the category. So in principle, you can do it, but I mean, we didn't do it in this paper. It's more complicated, but those give you in, independent. I mean, for this case, I guess the world identities will always, if you don't decorate, will tell you self-duality, but uh, uh, you you can consider decorating with defects. And so, I mean, yeah, so, but we did, then there are a lot of consistency conditions, which is how you slide endos for each other. And that we didn't look at carefully, but I think that's one way in which you kind of see anomalies for the symmetry, no? So it's still to be done, but I think that this presentation is quite economical for the, like trying to do calculation with, because the full manifolds are very complicated. Uh, in low, lower dimension, like in two dimension, you don't need this. You you just take sigma g and uh, go by hand the drawing, no? Mm. Ah, the bulk theory cannot see the Z two subgroup because it's uh, it's uh, it doesn't have one from symmetry charge, so the bulk is uh, agnostic. Now you have my point of view is the following: I have to specify a, a one morphism when I put the two things together, which is consistent with the physical expectations. Is that I want to get the, the one half defect, which is the only possible thing. And uh, you cannot you cannot condense things which are charged because the bulk sees that. That's kind of not not it's not a local local operation on the defect because every time you put a line which is charged, you you have put a surface in the bulk. No? While these uncharged ones they are invisible, so it's a, an, an allowed operation. And I mean, it turns out is the only sensible one. If you don't do it, you don't get a consistent answer. So this is like a bit the pi zero of the category, you know, this uh, in which you identify two defects if they differ by some, uh, if, if they have some topological interface between them. And here we're like taking this equivalence. So, and you can consider more complicated things. So one thing you can consider is that you can consider a condensate ending at the interface too. And then you can uh, you can create some interfaces which implement uh, zero form symmetries of the T of the of the TQFT. You can do some more real stuff. But this is like the basic one. And uh, yeah, the, the interesting thing is that this condensation, even if it's uh, the defect you condense is not visible from the bulk, you can still find some observables which can see that you had condensed something. So you leave behind some TQFT, which can be seen from the bulk. It, it, it's essentially these lines that uh, cannot go through, that get stuck on the interface. If you cook it up in the right way, you can uh, detect them from the bulk. So that's physical. You can pass toothed lines uh, through and see. So it's, it's, it's not the same thing. Okay, next up we have uh, Chi Ming Cheng, who is going to, oh, I don't remember your title. <laughs> hey. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, so I will talk about my uh paper last year with uh Jin Chen and Feng Jun Xu, and that is an extension of my previous paper, uh, from uh 2018. Okay. So I will first review uh something about non-invertible symmetries in 2D bosonic CFT, and then uh, I will discuss non-invertible symmetries in 2D fermioni CFTs. Okay. So first, um, 
symmetries can be defined in terms of charge operators, uh, which are topological defects. And for example, we can consider a symmetry group G and a group element small g, and then we have a, a symmetry defect labeled by the group element uh, as UG, and then we wrap this symmetry defect around some local operator O, and then we can shrink it because it's topological, so that we get again a local operator that's the symmetry action G acting on operator O. <laughs> and there is a different way to think about the symmetry action uh, on the local operator O that is considering the uh, topological defect passing through the local operator O. And we pass through, and then we get a symmetry action G on O. And um, so the symmetry defect, they are topological, and so we can bring them arbitrarily close to each other. So suppose we have UG1, UG2, and we bring them arbitrarily close to each other, we get the new defect UG1, G2. That's the uh, G1, G2 is the group multiplication of the group element G1, G2. That's the full fusion. We can actually consider a partial fusion, that is, we bring a small piece of the two topological defects arbitrarily close to each other. So uh, only uh, this region, the defect fuse together and get UG1, G2. And there is also the inverse element, UG inverse, that's uh, given by just the orientation reversal of the the mandible M that we put the defect on. Um, so, uh, so previously the thing I talked about are invertible defects, but in general, the topological defect fusion can be non-invertible. And in general, we have this um, fusion rule. Uh, so recall that I said that uh, the inverse, uh, previously the inverse element is given by the orientation reversal. So now I take a uh, defect L uh, fused with its orientation reversal. And then um, in general, on the right-hand side, we will have a, a trivial defect, but uh, nothing stops us to add in some other non-trivial defects on the right-hand side. And so that's be a more general fusion rule and it's non-invertible. And for the non-invertible uh, symmetry, uh, the action is still on local operator, is still given by uh, wrapping the defect on local operator and shrink it to zero size. But um, it's, it's more interesting if we consider uh, the topology that passing through the local operator O. So now uh, I can see this configuration. I can do a partial fusion as I described before on, on this, this small piece and get this configuration. And now uh, I, uh, uh, so, so this middle line is the fusion of the L and L inverse, and then we apply our previous fusion rule, and we, we get a trivial line. So here I just do not draw a trivial line, and also some other lines. And we have a more interesting configuration than just the action of line on the local operator O. So uh, in this configuration, in particular, we have an endpoint of a line ending on some local operator, and also a junction. So let's look at this configuration in more detail. So first, uh, let's uh, try to understand the endpoint of the Tabasha defect line. To understand it, is uh, it would be good to first um, uh, clarify when, when, we, when we talk about uh, the symmetry defect versus symmetry operator. So the symmetry in quantum field theory has a play a dual role as operator and defect. Uh, it can be understood uh, very easily by considering the quantization on a cylinder. So in this case. Um, so uh, our the, 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 this S1 times R, the S1 direction is our space and R direction is the time. And uh, we pick a time size and uh, associated to this time size, there's a Hilbert space edge. And now we can wrap the topological divide along the non-contractible cycle. So along, along the S1. And now we can bring it uh, arbitrarily close to the time size we pick. And that will give us an action L hat on the uh, this Hilbert space. So this it, this view is viewing the symmetry as an operator, and but we can uh, insert the topology defect in a different direction along the time direction, like this configuration. And now uh, there is an intersection between the topology defects and the our time size. So this will change our quantization and give us a different Hilbert space. And here I label it by uh, HL. And um, in this di different Hilbert space, there could be uh, some uh, up, some operator psi 
oh, sorry, some state side. And now we can apply the state operator correspondence to get the new uh, operator uh, side. And that would be the, what we call defect operator uh, living at the end point of the topological defect line. And at least Hilbert space HL is called the defect Hilbert space. Okay, uh, we can play this game uh, for uh, multiple uh, intersection of lines uh, uh, be, uh, with our uh, time slice and get a uh, more general defect Hilbert space, in this case, H, uh, L1, L2, L3, and then apply the state operator correspondence, we get some local operator uh, living at the uh, junction of three topological defects. And um, so in general, the operator living at the junction can have non-zero uh, dimension spin. So the, for example, the correlation function would depend on the position of this junction. But uh, we can actually take uh, the operator at the junction to have zero spin and conformal weight. That's what usually people do. And in this case, the junction will also be topological. It's also freely to move. And um, viewing the symmetry uh, as operator versus uh, defects also give us a strong constraint on the symmetry. Uh, for example, uh, we can look at a partition function like this first. Uh, we twist the partition function by inserting uh, the, the symmetry operator L hat in this trace over this Hilbert space H. And that gives us some partition function. It's called the twisted partition function. And, but we can uh, do S transformation. And then we get a configuration that the lines along the time direction. And in this case, it's again the trace, but it's a trace over the defect Hilbert space HL. And if we want to have a well-defined defect Hilbert space, then that means the Q expansion of this defect partition function, ZL, must have a positive integer coefficient. And that's the defect Cauchy condition. And this condition will give us a strong constraint on the, both the defect Hilbert space and the symmetry action L hat. Um, so this is, a, the, I would say, the simplest example. And in the 2D IC model, IC CFT, and in this theory, there are three uh, local operators, uh, sorry, three primary local operators, uh, the identity operator, spin, uh, sorry, energy operator and the spin operator. And I, I also write down their conformal weight. Um, so in this theory, also three uh, simple topological defect lines. And uh, so we, we know this by actually solving the defect Cauchy condition that I just talked about. And the solution will be that, so the first line will just act uh, trivially on all these three uh, local operators. And the second eta lines is actually, uh, it ge actually generates the Z2 symmetry of the IC model. It acts, on, uh, acts trivially on one and epsilon, and it has eigenvalue minus one on the spin operator. And the third line is actually uh, non-invertible. And we can see this by, uh, looking at the, the solution that it acts as zero on the sigma field. So it cannot be inverse because zero has no inverse. And using this table, we can also read off uh, the fusion rules and get, so for example, this eta square equals one, then that's the Z2 fusion rule. And N square equals to one plus eta. And also from this fusion rule, we know that N is non-invertible. Um, so the, and also the top anomaly of non-invertible symmetry are captured by the F moves of uh, these topological defect lines. And the F move is a generalization of the partial fusion that we talk about. And in the partial fusion is a, a very special case of F move, but in general, we can have a more general F move and then the coefficient in this matrix in F move is called F matrices. And they are invariant uh, along the RG flow and you can argue this by using a very similar argument as the top anomaly matching. Um, and these F moves or, or the, the anomaly of non-invertible symmetry are, are constrained by uh, the Pentagon equation. That is, we apply the F move along this top uh, direction, we apply three F moves, and we can also apply two F moves and go in this down direction, and we get the same uh, beginning and final configuration, and then these two ways of uh, applying F moves should give you the same answer. And that would uh, strongly constrain the F matrices. Um, and this this is called the Pentagon equation, and is a generalization of closeness condition of the group cohomology for the 2D invertible symmetry. 
Okay. Okay, now um let me uh go to uh discussing the the uh non-invertible symmetry in 2D fermionic CFT. So first, uh let me just say some basics about uh fermionic CFTs. And and first thing is of course, uh, now the local operator can be either bosonic or fermionic. And because the operator can be fermionic, exchanging the order of two fermionic operators in the correlation function will give us a minus sign. And for example, like this, we have OF and OF prime. And now I exchange the ordering in the correlation function. And then that gives us a minus sign. And uh, I, I would like to emphasize that here, I do not exchange the space-time position. I just exchange the ordering in the correlation function. And this minus sign is due to that uh, because in the path integral formalism, there are uh, Grassmann value fields. And also, um, when we go around non-contractable cycles, uh, suppose we put the theory on some uh, Riemann surfaces and there are some non-contractable cycles, then the fermionic operators will have periodic or anti-periodic boundary condition when we go along these cycles. And now I would like to uh, generalize this to, to the case of the defect operators, because we have seen that uh, topology defect lines can end some defect operators and they can in general have non-zero uh, conform weight and spin. So uh, uh, similarly, so the ordering of this defect operator in correlation functions will also uh, 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 be important here if this defect operator are fermionic and then exchange the ordering will also lead to, to signs. And there are another effect is that um, it is, is, is the generalization of this boundary condition. But for defect operator, it's actually not good to think of uh, this as boundary condition because uh, for the for the local operator, we think of that as boundary condition because we, we, we move the operator around some cycle, we go back to the original configuration. But for defect operator, it, it carry a, a, an extra topology defect lines. So if you move it around the non-contractual non cycle, you do not go back to the original configuration. So it's better to think of this NS versus R as a different identification on the multi-covering space of, of, of the Riemann surface. For example, consider the case of a cylinder. And in this case, uh, we can, uh, for this configuration, we can use a double cover of a cylinder. And um, so we have, for example, this guy and, and that guy. Uh, they, they, they should be identified in some way. And uh, the, the, the way to identify them is that we, we put this minus one to the sigma here. And for if the, uh, if the defect operator O is bosonic, then sigma is zero and fermionic if sigma is one. And also this, this one, two, uh, so this small red one, two, basically denote their ordering in the correlation function. And one very simple example of the, the topology defect lines in Fermiani CFD is, is this uh, fermion parity minus one to F topology defect line. And this is universal for all Fermiani CFDs. And uh, the Roman sector operators are defect operators living at the end point of this minus one to F TDL. Um, so uh, besides this, I would say uh, spin structure on the line. You would say, or is that the same as orientation? Not think of in that way. So maybe it will be it would matter. And in the case where I have, uh, the, the this later case where I have Q type symmetry, and we, will, I think we will see that what in in what case it will matter. So here the the defects are just uh, stuck at the end point. So so I think this if you, whether you want to put spin structure on the line, it wouldn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that would be the this situation. If you have some some fermionic topology that that can uh, freely move along, so some some fermionic operator that can freely move on the on the line, then in that case that might matter.
Um, like I, 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 I haven't thought thought about this point, but then I would think I would always use the induced one. Um, so in fermionic CFT, there's a new type of Tabachi defect line called, and then it also induces a new type of symmetry. It's called Q-type symmetry. And first, it has no analog in bosonic CFT. And the the it, the important thing of it is that it has a one-dimensional Marana fermion uh, living at, at the TDL. And and because it's 1D Marana fermion, it has zero conformal weight. So so they, are, they, they can freely move along the Tabachi defect lines. And uh, in particular, um, the 1D Maran fermion can be pair create or pair annihilate, and like like this picture. So I draw this red uh, dot as the 1D Maran fermion, and this this can be viewed as pair creation or pair annihilation. They can also act on the junction, and for example, like this. Suppose you you have a bosonic uh, junction at here. So that means you have some bosonic operator living at a junction, and then uh, you move this red dot arbitrarily close to the junction, then that gives you a fermionic operator living at a junction. Um, so uh, the the so so this uh, pair creation and the acting on junction will actually give us some constraint on the f move uh, the f matrices. So the constraints are coming from uh, looking at this this edge junction. Uh, you have some, so suppose the intermediate line is Q-type, and then um, we can consider pair creation of the two uh, uh, 1D Marana fermion, like, like this middle configuration, and then move these two 1D Marana fermion arbitrarily close to the, to the junction and act on the junction and get this configuration. And uh, it would turns out that it would give us a, a projection condition on the F matrix. And the F matrix is also similar to the to the Bosoni CFD case. It will also satisfy some uh, Pentagon equation. And in this case, it's called the super Pentagon equation because we have an extra lag. And 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 this extra lag is uh, this extra move is given by we exchange the ordering of two uh, operators uh, living at at these two trivalence junction in the correlation function. So here I have one and two. Uh, recall that this small red one and two are the ordering of the operator in the correlation function, and that exchange that to two and one, and that will leaves uh, uh, it, it, so if this uh, the operator operator living at a junction are fermioni, that will give us an extra minus sign. Um, so the projection condition and the super pentagon equation uh, together will admit only finally many possible solutions of the F matrices up to some gauge transformation. And then we can use them to classify uh, the F moves basically by just solving this equation. And uh, as I said, a mathematical structure of, of it is called the fusion superfusion category. And uh, so I would I would talk about some uh, classification of, of superfusion category by solving the projection and the projection condition and super Pentagon equation, but before that, let me first uh, talk about uh, the in, what do we mean by invertible Q-type symmetry. So, because there is a one D Maran fermion living on the Q-type defect lines, so so uh, if I fuse uh, th this LQ with LQ in uh, the orientation reversal, then uh, I will actually get two times uh, the trivial uh, trivial line. And, and this two uh, is one plus one, and one is coming from the, the identity operator, that's, that's Bosoni operator, and the other is coming from the 1D Marana fermion, living on the line. And so uh, we, if we want this uh, LQ to be invertible, uh, then uh, we, we can set, uh, basically, that this dot dot equals zero. And uh, be, but besides that, we also need to uh, rescale our definition of uh, topology defect lines. For example, like let, let's list let, rescaling. I define L tilde is LQ uh, over square root of two, such that uh, if I uh, 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 multiply or uh, fuse L tilde with L tilde bar, the right hand side would just get the trivial line, but but not nothing. There is no vector of two, and but because we we do this rescaling, um, the L tilde uh, does not have a proper defect Hilbert space. In particular, its defect partition function has a 
uh, square root of two in front and that multiplies something as a integer Q expansion. And uh, one example of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the invertible Q type symmetry is the, the case in uh, free fermion uh, Q left and Q right uh, CFT. And in this CFT, we have a uh, minus one to F left uh, fermion parity that, that only act on uh, side left. And and this uh, is a, a Q type uh, non a Q type invertible symmetry. Um, so now let me uh, discuss a classification of the rank two uh, superfusion category. And in this case, we restrict to rank two. So there are two uh, simple Tabach developed lines. I uh, of course one is the trivial line, and the other line I call it W. And this W can be uh, either M type or Q type. And for M type, uh, uh, it could have uh, these two types of uh, fusion. So now I uh, so so this now I write these fusion numbers uh, uh, separately as with this B or F label. They are um, uh, so so these numbers are coming from the bosonian fermioni degrees of freedom. So I just uh, write them separately. And if W is a Q type, and then we have seen that. Um, the, the coefficient in front of the trivial line must be uh, a 1b and 1f. And um, okay. And, but in, in general, we can have some other uh, terms uh, show up on the right hand side. So these will be our input to plug into the uh, super Pentagon equation and also the projection condition. And by solving the super Pentagon equation projection condition, we in total find uh, 18, solu 18 uh, gauging equivalent solutions, and eight of them are uh, uh, invertible uh, uh, symmetry. So they are basically Z2 symmetries. And, um, and it's known that the Z2 anomaly in Fermiani theories are classified by the, the ZA classification. And this new is a ZA uh, value. And um, so in our case, um, so uh, when, when nu is odd, is the W line is actually Q type. And when nu is even, then the W lines are M type. And these, so, so, they are, so simple, simple realization of this Z8 is just given by uh, a new free Marana fermion. And but more interestingly are the, the other solutions when uh, the lines are non-invertible. And, and here I list uh, the remaining term solutions and also their uh, CFD realizations uh, in terms of Fermi minimal models. And in particular, we can see that there are uh, interesting uh, non-invertible Q-type symmetry, and they can be realized in some exceptional Fermi Fermi minimal models. And uh, uh, finally, let me mention uh, one uh, quite important uh, observation we have, that is um, the relation between Q-type symmetry and Fermioni symmetry. And what do we mean by Fermioni symmetry? Uh, so in the in Fermioni CFT, we can have some Fermioni currents. They are have integer spin uh, uh, operators. And um, for example, uh, for supersymmetric theory, uh, for example, N equals one supersymmetry, we have a super conformal current. They have spin three half, and they generate the super Verisora symmetry. And actually, in all example we have seen, uh, the Q type symmetry plays a role as R symmetry of some. Uh, Fermiani symmetry. And um, for example, for the super Verisoral case, and that the simplest case is uh, M equals four Fermiani minimal model. And uh, we can see that uh, there is a Z2 invertible, non-invertible Q-type, uh, sorry, invertible Q-type symmetry. That's the R symmetry of the, the, the super Verisoral algebra. And also in the, in the simple case of free Marana fermion, the fermion translation symmetry is generated by just the Fermion itself, and then the Z2 uh, left uh, Fermion parity is uh, also acts on the, this Fermion. And also there are so many more example um, in, in more uh, complicated Fermion in CFD. And so, so we have some kind of conjecture saying that the Q-type symmetry are always R symmetry of some Fermion symmetries. Okay, um, so this is summary and outlook, and I think I'm out of time, so let me just stop here. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, let me skip the summary. So the 
uh, maybe more interesting um, uh, outlook is that we, because the minus one to F symmetry is always a symmetry of Fermioni CFD. So it might be good to classify the, the fusion super fusion category with that particular line. And that would be some uh, future work. And uh, of course, the better understanding of the relation between Q-type symmetry and Fermioni symmetry, and also whether we can generalize Q-type symmetries to higher dimension. Questions? Can there be finite versions of fermionic symmetries? Um, I don't know any example, and it, it looks like that. But because now I I kind of define the fermionic symmetries by saying that there's a fermionic current, so that's always uh, even a version. I don't know any example of it. I I also wonder whether fermionic symmetries are the ones that Niels wanted with a different spin structure. But of course, yeah, it's just a uh, speculation. Thank you. Um, so in uh, non-fermionic CFTs, the rational ones are described in terms of modular fusion categories. When you say super fusion categories here, you, do you mean a super version of modular fusion categories? Um, or does the modular, the braiding, no, I play a role for you? Uh, I don't, in, in, in our discussion here, I do not have Rating structure. So, um, for I think for for general CFT, uh, in particular irrational CFT, the the topology defined line layer they do not have a a, a, a natural uh, braiding structure. Only rational CFT they have uh, some braiding structure. And Oh, sure. Uh, okay, good. Um, and then I wanted to ask whether you uh, have um, by any chance looked at this recent work by Runkel, uh, Watts, and Segedi, Segedi and Watts, um, which uh, who I think have the, the goal to develop the fuchs runkel Schweigert work on rational CFT in, in, the, in various Z2 graded settings and whether you can say something about the relation. I, I do not know about their work, so maybe I should. Okay, thank you. Their work. So, so, I mean, every fermionic CFT can be bosonized, you know? That's yes. uh, okay. So I think there is a way to, maybe simpler, to classify fermionic symmetries by taking a bosonic uh, fusion category with Z2 symmetry. In understanding the process of fermionizing, is this developed? Right, right. That I I didn't mention, but um, there, there there's a way to uh, given some uh, bosonic uh, say, uh, I think you need uh, actually modular tensor category to get a, you, there's a way to get a fermionic superfusion category that's called a fermion condensation, but that is a, a, a but, but but that procedure require uh uh require some more condition i mean if you want to do this procedure to get some super fusion category and there are some some of my my example of super fusion category they actually cannot be uh, obtained uh, from the fermion condensation for example this one that's a, a quite yeah, that's why you have a question mark uh <laughs> because yeah. all the examples come from <laughs> fermionizing bosonic minimal models right yes. um true yeah and in also in this case we also do not know the CFD realization. Probably there's no CFD. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that, that's, oh, yes, that's another thing. So if you consider fermion condensation this procedure, you, you will not get minus one to F and the minus one to F is inversion. And, but here I, I proceed in a, di a different way that is instead of consider fermion condensation, we consider just directly try to solve the consistent condition. And in that procedure, it, it, it's you, 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 it's possible to include minus one to F, but we didn't. And including minus one to F is a part of the fusion, future work. Yes, yes. Right, that's possible, yeah. And and uh, yeah, by the way, there, there was a question about spin structure. I think I can have a 
maybe a, a, a sound say some more words about it. So the spin structure might matter if, if in this uh, fermion pair creation. And so in this case, um, there, there are some ambiguity uh, because I, I said that when we want to pair create fermions, then then uh, the ordering of fermion in the correlation function will matter. But but now, uh, I mean, we, so so now I need to label these two fermion as by one or two, but but here, the, just by this creation, you need to make a choice of, of labeling them by one and two, the, the, the ordering in the correlation function. They will be different up to a minus sign. So I think if you have some, some spin structure uh, on the line, then then that might give a way to fix the this slight ambiguity. Yeah, uh, yeah, so so the ordering will also be fixed if you have a orientation. Right. So but there are some some lines has no orientation, for example the the Z2 line. Yeah, if if you have, do not have list dot dot and the, you just say like LQ equals LQ bar and then it has no uh, orientation and but maybe I, I'm not sure maybe also it's possible to use spin structure to fix the of fermion pair creation. Yes. You mean if I consider a higher rank super fusion category and then that does that the invertible I, I I I think so, yes. I I, th I think so. I, I think I think the super pentagon and also this projection condition, they if if you try to solve them, they will include the invertible case. So the invertible case will always be solutions. Super fusion, uh, super Pentagon equation and fashion condition. The, the... Well, I don't know. 